Hello everyone, a very special warm welcome to you all. We thank you for joining us for another Church at Home service. November is truly a special month for us here at People's Church because not only do we get to spend time together online, but we also get to spend time together in person to worship. Of course, following all COVID-19 protocols. Now, isn't that a special moment? In an uncertain time, such as a time that we're in now, the new normal times, we would like to encourage you with a scripture in 1 Peter 5 verse 7 that says, Casting all our anxieties and worries to him because he cares for us. In a moment, we are going to be hearing a message from Pastor Mondli. But before we get into that, let us take time to worship together. Please do enjoy. Shaking up the atmosphere As the shadows fade into nothing as the days appear Beyond the skies above Love reaching out for us The everlasting one Jesus of Oh, we look to the sun, set eyes on the Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun, creation, waking up to kingdom come. There's no fear in love and no darkness in his endless night. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun.
Greetings, People's Church. I was reflecting on the fact that we're able to have our first physical meeting this past Sunday. The first one since the 15th of March this year. And I was looking at all the planning and logistics that went into preparing for that service. And I would like to say thank you. Thank you for making it possible. Thank you for seeing this as something valuable. Thank you for seeing people's church as something that is valuable. I really believe that ultimately that, that, that's what makes people give into anything because they see it as valuable. And it's not only valuable and beneficial to you, it's valuable and beneficial to people that you don't even know, people that you might not even meet. And in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 6.21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You made a decision to put your treasure and consequently your heart here in people's church. You decided that this is where your treasure should go. This is where your heart is. And in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is talking about the church in Macedonia. The church that is going through severe testing, extreme poverty, he says in the opening verses. But Paul, in the same breath, speaks about their generosity. That even during those trying times, they were able to be generous. In verse 8, he points this out. He says, they gave themselves to the Lord first. So before they were generous, they were committed to God first. They decided that this was a priority in their lives because God was already a priority in their lives. If you want to see what someone values, follow the money trail. Follow their spending habits. We're not saying that things like investing or spending, whatever it is that you spend your money on are not important. But they're not as important as the, kingdom, as the kingdom of God because that will last forever. We continue to pray that what God is doing at People's Church continues to be of value to you, continues to be a priority to you and your family. God bless you as you give. I would like to ask you a question. And I don't want you to think too much about it. Just give me the first response that comes to your mind. And the question is simple. The question is this. What do you think God is like? You know, there was a story that is told about a schoolboy who was asked that same question. And he replied that as far as he could make out, God was the sort of person who is always snooping around to see if anyone is enjoying him or herself and then trying to put an end, trying to put a stop to it. And I think that there's way too many people even right now who would respond in a similar way to that question. What is God like? And I think that that is a shame because nothing could be further from the truth. Today we're going to focus on a very well-known parable that is found in Luke chapter 15 from verse 11 to verse 32. In some uh, Bible translations it is called the parable of the prodigal son. In fact, I have even preached on this, uh, on this parable before, but I hope that today we'll be able to see or learn something new, something different that will be able to help us in our lives. And so the context for this entire chapter, chapter 15, the entire context is found within the first two verses. The first verse says that uh, tax collectors and sinners were coming towards Jesus to hear him speak. Second verse says that the Pharisees and the scribes complained that Jesus, in fact another translation says they were grumbling that Jesus was receiving and eating with, with sinners, something that was completely unthinkable in their minds. And so Jesus responded to them by telling them three similar parables. And all these parables have the same meaning. And they are all to illustrate God's attitude 
and God's response towards sinners who repent. And he repeats a, a similar phrase or similar statement in verse 7 and verse 10 to underline the main purpose, the main reason, the main meaning for these parables. In verse 7, we find this. It says, just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Verse 10 says, just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the meaning of the parables. This is the point that Jesus is driving across. Straight after this, he launches into his third and final parable within this trilogy of parables. And it begins in verse 11 and it says, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. You know, the, this parable is so rich in context and detail, we're not definitely going to be able to dive into all of it. But there's a lie that I think um, that is very prevalent in our lives, in, in our day and age right now. And it's the lie that tells us that true freedom is found in the absence of all rules and all boundaries and all constraints. And, and in essence, it is telling us that the, the satisfying life, we will only be able to experience the satis satisfying life if we rid ourselves of all boundaries and all constraints. And I believe that it is the same lie that the enemy, the devil, was telling to Adam and Eve right there in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. And he was telling them that God put rules in place to rob them of something, that God is holding something back from them. That is why he has given them the rules and the constraints. That is why he has allowed them to eat of certain trees and, and not eat from certain trees. It is because he is withholding something back from them, something that is good. And in, in essence, he said, you are not going to die. In fact, you are going to become like God. And so what he was saying is that God doesn't want you to become like him. That is why he forbids you to eat from that particular tree. And I believe that it is the same lie that we are being bombarded with through TV, through social media, through magazines today, that the reason God says no to sex before marriage is because he does not want us to enjoy sex. The reason God forbids heavy drinking and partying is because he doesn't want you and I to enjoy life. And that the reason God forbids extramarital affairs is because he doesn't want you and I to fully explore and fully enjoy and fully express ourselves. That is the same lie. And there are some of you, if you were to be honest, there are some of you right now who are not Christians today. And the reason for that is because you think God's primary mission in life is to prevent anyone from enjoying life and having a good time. You still want to enjoy your life. So you are not going to become a Christian just yet. Maybe you're going to do that a little bit later in your life once you have enjoyed life and you have bought into a lie. That is not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to see that today as we dive into this parable. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this. He says, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, talking about himself. He says, I have come so that they may have life. I want them to have it in the fullest possible way way. This is Jesus himself talking here. This is the primary reason that he says he has come. He has come so that we may have life and have it in the fullest possible way. And I believe that it is this same lie is the same lie that forced this younger brother to make this decision that he has made in, the, in this parable that we are reading about. It is the same lie that the younger brother believed about his father. You know, and, and so many younger brothers in our lives, in our day and age today, believe the same lie, that my father is holding me back. My father doesn't want me to enjoy life. You know, my mother is holding me back. My parents are too old-fashioned and don't know anything about life today. Why must we listen to our parents when they tell us how to live our own lives? You know, my father is too controlled 
controlling or my mother is too controlling. What I need to do is to be free from the control of my father. I need to leave home. Yes, that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become my own man. I'm, my own man. I'm going to become my own woman. I'm going to live life in, on my own terms. I'm not going to listen to anyone else. Re listen to what uh, C.S. Lewis wrote some 68 years ago. This is what he wrote within the same topic that we are talking about today. He said, moral rules are directions for running the human machine. Every moral rule is there to prevent a breakdown or a strain or a friction in the running of that machine. That is why these rules at first seem to be constantly interfering with our natural inclinations. When you are being taught how to use any machine, the instructor keeps on saying to you, no, don't do it like that. Because of course, there are all sorts of things that look all right and seem to you the natural way of treating the machine, but do not read really work. Listen to what the, the writer of Proverbs chapter 14 wrote in verse 12. He says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. And this is what we are talking about today. There's so many ways within the eyes of young people that, that seem right to them. But in the end, they will lead to death. This is a lie. It is a trap. It is a deception. It is not going to end well with you. And the rules that we find in Scripture, the rules are put by God to help us experience life in its fullness, not the other way around. The rules are not there to withhold something good from us. The rules are there to help us to be able to experience the full and satisfying life that God created us to, to actually enjoy. Think about this. Marriage is actually at its best when all its boundaries and rules are respected and observed. And I believe that life itself is always at its best when all its boundaries and rules are respected and observed. You could, you could right now I believe that you could right now be contemplating living home because you believe ultimate freedom is found in the absence of all rules. Or you could be contemplating living your marriage because you believe that ultimate freedom is only experienced in the absence of all rules, that all these rules you know, are, are cumbersome. They are withholding something good from you. Or you could be contemplating living the church right now because of the same reasoning and the same thing that you have believed. Because you have bought that lie that says what you need is more freedom. And that true freedom is a life lived without any rules. I want you to hear this. If you do not hear anything that I say today, I want you to hear this one statement. That true freedom is only found within appropriate boundaries and constraints. True freedom is only found within appropriate boundaries and constraints, not the other way around. The other way is a lie. The other way will not lead you anywhere good. The other way will only lead to death. And to live free of all boundaries, to live free of all rules, will actually not result in you experiencing true freedom, but rather it will result in you making a complete wreck of your life. Read scriptures, you will find so many examples that will attest to this fact of people that have lived that way and look at how their lives ended up, including this young man that you are reading about today. In verse 14, the, the, the Bible continues and it says, And when he had spent everything, because at some point it was going to run out, the way that he was squandering it, at some point it was going to run out. And it says, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields, into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything to eat. And this was always where his lifestyle was going to lead him all along. And this is where he hit what so many people call rock bottom. And it is unfortunate that so many people need to first hit rock bottom before they come to their senses. And, I and some scholars actually believe that at this point he was actually a slave. He wasn't just a hired hand. He wasn't just a person who was working for an income. He was actually a slave. And, and they quote um, verse 16. In fact, if you read verse 16 in the New King James Version. It says, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs ate or the swine ate 
and no one gave him anything to eat. He was longing for what the pigs were eating. He was looking forward, you know, to the meal that the pigs were eating. And he would have gladly had he were given the opportunity. The problem was he was not even given the opportunity to eat what the pigs ate. Because remember, if you were a slave, you were not even allowed to steal. You couldn't even steal from the pigs because he was going to get punished. And it says no one gave him anything to eat. So he was not just working for an income. He wasn't even being fed for, for the work that he was doing. And he would have gladly taken from the pigs and ate. That is how low he had sunk. That is, that is the, the, the effects of sin in his life. That is where his lifestyle led him to. Rock bottom. And that is where the Bible says he came to his senses. That is where he returned to his right mind. And that is where he began to ask himself. He said, how many of my father's servants are well taken care of while I am starving to death here? This is what I'm going to do. I need to go back to my father and to apologize. At this point in time, you know, the, the people that are working for my father are even living a much better life, are having a much better existence than I am having right now. What I need to do is to humble myself and to go back. This is when he came to his mind and he said, I will tell my father I am no longer worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your servants. And I want to ask you the same question. If you are still down that path towards destruction, if you are still living life according to your own means, you know, according to your own will, you are doing whatever you want to do, you know, you are living life the way that you want to live it. I want to ask you this question. When are you going to come to your senses? What will it take for you to come to your senses? It is, is it also going to take you reaching rock bottom before you realize you know, that I am not where I am supposed to be. That there's a home where, in, where I belong. Right here, I'm not even at home. I am a slave. I'm living a pathetic, a pathetic existence. There is a father at home who loves me, who is waiting for me. What is it going to take? And he, this is what this young man said. He said, I am no longer even worthy to be called a son. And you may also be saying the same thing right now in the situation that you find yourself in, that there's no way that God will be able to accept you, that you are not worthy, that you are too messed up, that you have made simply too many mistakes, that your sins are too great and they could never be forgiven. This is the other thing I want you to understand and to understand clearly clearly that as long as you are alive that you are never too far gone for God's love to reach you if, as long as there's breath in your lungs that your situation is not too hopeless you can still make a turn around you can still come to your senses like this young man did you can still make up your mind and say I am going back to my father I'm going to apologize I'm going to to ask for him to even make me a servant I no longer deserve to to go back to the state that I was in but the important thing is that you make up your mind the important thing is that you go back to the father and it continues in verse 20 and this is where i want us to just focus a little bit because this is where we see the response of the father verse 20 and it says and he arose and came to his father but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and felt compassion he ran and embraced him and kissed him Think about this. I want you to picture this. That this young man is probably still uh, filthy right now. He was feeding pigs. He probably smells like a pigsty. The sun has scorched him. He is wearing torn and dirty clothes. He is weak and ravished by sinful living. You know, he is like one of those boys that are, sm uh, that are smoking nyaupe on the streets. This is what he probably looks like because of the lifestyle that he was living. But the father pays no notice to any of that. The Bible says he saw him while he was still a great distance far off and he decided to run to meet him halfway and he embraced him and he kissed him and he fell upon his neck because he said this is my son it doesn't matter what he looks like at the at this particular moment it doesn't matter where he finds himself right now but he is my son and he has decided to come back home i love him and i welcome him back into my house and it continues verse 22 and verse 23 it says but the father said to his servants while the son is busy you know, trying to rehearse, trying to uh, 
trying to, uh, to actually say his prepared speech to say he is no longer worthy to be called a son. Please make him a, a little bit less. Make him like one of the servants. While he is trying to recite that same prepared speech, the father interjects. The father interrupts him. And this is what he says. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, paying no attention to what he's saying. He says to his servant, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate because this son of mine was dead, now he is alive. This son of mine was lost and now he is found. This is a joyous moment. This is not a moment to be judging. This is not a moment to be punishing. This is not a moment, you know, to be, to be lashing out on him, telling him that you told him so. This is a moment to celebrate because he was dead and now he is alive. He was lost and now he is found. And I want you to know that this is the same radical love and response that God gives to anyone who repents, anyone who makes a decision to say, you know what, I've had enough. You know what, the way that I'm living is not working. I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to humble myself and apologize. This is the same response that God gives to you. God is not angry at you. Rather, he is waiting in anticipation for the day when you will return back home. And I can just imagine this father waking up each morning and hoping perhaps today is the day that I'll see my son again in the land of the living. Perhaps today is the day as he goes to sit on that porch to look in the far distance on the, on the highway or on the road saying in his heart, perhaps today I hope today is the day and I want you to know that God has the same anticipation for your homecoming. God has the same anticipation for the day that you will come to your senses and realize that at home you have a place where you belong. At home there is a family. At home there is a father who loves you. At home there's a father who, who is not angry at you and who will not disown you so that you will be able to come back home. And I believe that now is the time for you to make your comeback. Now is the time for you to make up your mind and say, I am going to go back to my father and I'm going to go back home. This is not home. I want to go back home. I believe this is the time for you if you have not made that decision. And I'm just going to answer five questions very quickly that are, that are uh, outlining what salvation is and what this homecoming journey is all about. Five questions, very simply, and the first one is, what is salvation? Understanding that Jesus did something you could never have done for yourself, and that is, he gave his life for the forgiveness of your sins. Understanding that, therefore, salvation is your response to that great gift by calling upon God to forgive your sins and make him and make you his own. That is what salvation is. After you understand what Jesus has done, salvation is you responding by calling up to God, crying up to God for forgiveness of your sins and for him to make you his own. Number two, who is it for? Salvation, I want you to understand, salvation is for everyone. There is no one who is excluded. It is not for a select few people. It is not for a few individuals, but it is for everyone. From a homeless person who is hopelessly addicted to drugs, to a CEO sitting in his penthouse, you know, CEO of a multinational corporation, and everyone in between. There is no one who is left out of this invitation. Salvation is for everyone. Number three, why does one need to be saved? Because if you do not accept the gift that God has given you, therefore you will have to bear your own sin on your own. It is as simply as that. And by that time, it will be too late for you to be able to accept God's free gift that he has given to you. Number four, how does one get saved? And it is simple. There's two things that the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that you, you need to repent and you need to believe. The first one, repentance. Repentance is about giving up your life of sins, your lifestyle of sinning, living the way that you want and turning your life towards God. That is repentance. What is belief? Believing is all about living according to God's will and not your own will. That is what it is in, in a simple nutshell. You need to repent and you need to believe. And the fifth question, 
question quickly. It is this, what does it mean to be saved? And I'll first tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that now you are perfect. That's not what it means. Salvation means you have given your life to God and are now trying uh, and are now living according to God's will, not your will. It means because of what Jesus did on the cross, your sins and my sins are forgiven, provided we continue living according to the will of God. It means you have God's Holy Spirit living inside of you, changing you day by day to become more like the person God created you to be. I hope that you take this important step today, that you do not defer it, that you do not delay it if you have not taken this step. Today is the moment where you need to come back home. Get on your knees, you know, uh, find a place, pray to God, call up to the name of God for forgiveness and for him. Ask him to make you his own. Uh, you can do that in any way. There are no magic words. That is the other thing we need to understand, that there are no magic words. The most important thing is a heart of sincerity and honesty as you are approaching God. And then the last part, I just want to focus on those of us that have made this decision before, maybe a couple of years ago. And I want us to, to, to realize, because this parable continues after the response of the Father, there is another portion, you know, that is directed at a completely different audience. And for me, as I was reading this parable, the one thing that I realized is that these three parables that are found in, in chapter 15, that they are actually rebukes towards the, the Pharisees and the scribes. Remember the context, verse 1 and verse 2. And so these, these, re, these uh, parables are actually a, a response to that, and they are actually a rebuke to the attitude of the Pharisees and that of the scribes. Because remember, the Pharisees and the scribes in today's you know, language, they would have been leaders in the church. And they were the ones who were indignant that Jesus was accepting and eating with sinners. And so I believe that this you know, was actually a rebuke to them. But I also think that it is far too easy for us to sit on the judgment seat and judge, you know, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, as we normally do. I think we tend to judge them too harshly sometimes, as if we would not have done the same thing had we been in their shoes. To be clear, the Pharisees and the scribes were actually the bad guys in this narrative. That much is clear. But I think there's a mistake that we make, and the mistake is that we automatically assume that we are the good guys in the story. But I believe that that is not always the case. And I just want to ask you this question. This question hit me like a ton of bricks as I was busy preparing. And, and I want to bring this question to you as well. And I'm hoping, you know, that this question is going to be able to help you somehow based on where you are. And the question is this, what is your attitude towards the lost? Right now, what is your attitude towards the lost and those that are turning towards God? And yes, I'm asking you, not the person next to you, but you. What is your attitude right now on those that are the lost or on those that are turning towards God? And I want you to really think about it because this question is very important. And, and is, uh, I, want, I want us to ask ourselves, is, is our attitude towards the lost that of apathy or that of passion? Are we passionate, you know, about, about seeking and saving the lost? You know, is our attitude, when we look at it, is it more like the attitude of the father in this parable? Or is it more like the attitude of the Pharisees who were angry at God, who were angry, you know, at Jesus, that he was sitting and accepting and eating with sinners? What is our attitude towards sinners right now. Are you filled with compassion when you see prodigal sons returning to God? Or are you filled with anger? Or do you feel like you are robbed of something when you see God loving sinners and sitting with sinners? Or are you filled with compassion and love? Are you drawn towards them or repulsed away from them? How do you feel when you see them attend church, the same church that you attend? Are you delighted or are you disgruntled? Do you think they are going to speak spoil our thing, you know, by bringing their dirty and filthy selves here. And, and I believe that one of the big problems with the church, historically, this is not a new problem, one of the historical problems with the church is that we quietly whisper, 
come as you are. You know, we quietly whisper, you know, you don't need to change yourself. Come as you are. But our actions are screaming something entirely different. Our actions are screaming, stay away until you have fixed and cleaned yourself up. Then and only then can you come as you are and be part of this thing. First, get your life in order before you come in here. You know, quit your drugs first. Fix your broken marriage. Get a job. Get a bath. You know, get a haircut before you come into this place. Clean yourself up first. And I want to remind us of this important thing, that the church was never meant to be our little neat and tidy thing, an exclusive members only club. It was never meant to be that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be in the business of seeking and saving the lost. We are supposed to be constantly on the lookout for prodigal sons and prodigal daughters making their way back home and celebrating whenever they make their way back home. You know, sometimes we tell ourselves over and over again that we exist for the sake of those who are not yet a part of us. But most of the time, we are actually not. We don't exist for them. We actually exist for those who walk and talk and think like us, who do things the same way that we think. And I think this parable is a rebuke to many of us. And I include myself in that, that this parable is actually a rebuke on my lifestyle, on my outlook as well. And I and we need to repent of that. We need to align our attitude and response towards sinners to that of the Father and not towards that of the, of the Pharisees. And last thing, think about this, that the older brother could have actually concluded this. As he came back home, heard the celebrations, he could have concluded and said this, and said, if the father loves my brother this much, despite all that he has done, it means he also loves me that much. He could have decided to be blown away by the love and the mercy of the father and came in and enjoyed the party. But he chose to sit in judgment over God because God loves people he shouldn't be loving. He decided to take that posture of folding the arms and judging God. And, and we could also be taking that posture right now, getting angry at God for, God for saving the people that he shouldn't be saving. We must never allow ourselves to outgrow that sense of awe and wonder at the illogical, disproportionate, unearned, undeserved love of God. We must allow it to completely blow and short circuit our minds every time we even think about it. We must never take the posture of the older brother whenever you see a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter coming home rejoice with the father let that remind you that that is exactly the same way that God feels about you that he loves you with an unearned and undeserved and unending kind of love let us pray our heavenly father thank you so much for your love that is completely illogical it makes no sense to our minds it is unending, unending, it is unearned, it is undeserved, it is freely given. Oh Lord God Almighty, thank you so much for your love, that you love us the same way that you love that prodigal son. Father, I pray that you remind us of that same truth. Doesn't matter how long we have been saved, remind us of that same truth, Lord God, that the same way that you love that prodigal son, that prodigal daughter, that is the same way that you feel about us. Help us, Father God, to never get to that place, Father God, where, where we, our posture is towards that of legalism, our posture is towards that of religion, where we are pointing fingers, sitting at the judgment seat. We are the ones who are calling the shots on how people are supposed to get saved, how people are supposed to behave, how people are supposed to dress in the church. That is not our role. Our role is to be out there seeking and saving the lost. Thank you so much, Father God, that you are the one who left the, the 99 to seek after that one. And that at some point, one day, I was that one that you left the 99 for to seek after. And right now, we have the incredible opportunity and privilege to be, to be partners with you in the same work, Father God, of going out there, seeking and saving the lost. This is the very reason that the Lord Jesus Christ came to give his life as a ransom for many so that prodigal sons and prodigal daughters can come back home thank you for everyone who has given their life to to you lord god today for the very first time pray lord jesus that you may help them to grow help them to mature on this new journey in jesus christ mighty name all glory and honor are due to your name now and forevermore amen isn't it wonderful that even in our christian life 
There is so much freedom. The freedom to live your life, follow your dreams, and be who you want to be. Like the scripture in John 10 verse 10 says, I have come so that you may have life and live it more abundantly. I really hope you enjoyed the service. If you want to join us for our in-person service next week Sunday, please register on the Church Center app or Church Center online. See you again next Sunday.